Welcome. Thanks for sticking around so long, everybody. It's human nature when we give something to want something in return. When I give $10,000 to my financial team, I want them to turn it into 20 quickly. When I go on a vacation, I want to have fun. And when I give my wife a back rub, I definitely want one in return. You see, what we all want in life is a reasonable return on our investments. As the founding director of the Families and Sport Lab at Utah State University, I spent a good portion of my early research career examining how parents invest in their children's organized youth sport. And what I've come to understand is that parents in many cases expect R, O, I, a return on their investment. Now, when I reflect on my own childhood, and surely when older generations reflect on theirs, it harkens back to something you might see in a Norman Rockwell painting. And although Norman's images are oftentimes more nostalgia than reality, I think he got this one right. Indeed, many of us likely remember an era when we jumped on our bikes, bat, glove, and hand, rode down to the neighborhood park or community sandlot, chose teams, and played until the sun went down. No parents, no coaches, no liability waivers, and no scoreboards. What I'd like to explore with you today is whether or not our children get the same experience in youth sport and the same kind of freedom in youth sport, or whether this context has been infiltrated by the logic of the free market, by the infusion of money, by the commodification of America's youth. Now, I know a lot about youth sports because when I wasn't making up games with the neighborhood kids, I was enrolled in organized youth sports, a lot of them. My parents introduced me to team sports at age five, back when it was cool to wait that long. And it's a love affair that's lasted my entire life. For as long as I can remember, my family and my sports have been intertwined. And I think it's that way today for a lot of American families. Growing up, I participated in soccer, basketball, baseball, and football. I was recruited to play football and baseball right here at Purdue University and was fortunate enough to be drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals in the fourth round. Throughout my entire journey, my parents were there for me. I mean, literally there at my games, but also there for me in so many other tangible and intangible ways. Today, in my professional role, I get to work with parents. I get to focus on parents and kids and what that means to them and their lives. And something that's important to me is the commodification of youth in organized sport. See, recent economic indicators suggest that youth sport has become a $15 billion industry. That's bigger than the NFL and the NBA combined. And while that's great news for camp organizers, private coaches, sporting goods manufacturers, and my job security, the structure and practice of organized youth sport today increasingly commodifies our nation's children and adolescents. If you're not following what I'm saying, think about it this way. A family you know spends $10,000 a year for 14 years to try and give their child the best experience and the best chance at success in sport. Club fees, tournament entries, travel, private coaching, perhaps recruiting services in high school. We think about these parents as good parents, don't we? We might use words like noble and selfless. But we could also suggest that these parents are chasing something, maybe a college scholarship, maybe more for their child in sport. So what is it that's noble and selfless about spending hundreds of thousands of dollars pursuing a college scholarship for our child when the scholarship's not even worth that much? The math simply doesn't add up. Today, sadly, parents and families are engaging in a context, a youth sport context that increasingly commodifies our nation's children and adolescents. But what is commodification? The Latin root of the word is commodus, which means a valued benefit. Colloquially, we define it as the transformation of goods, services, and ideas into objects of economic value. Scholars have also used the term to describe the monetary valuation of people. Today, I get to focus on youth sport parents and youth sport families, and I make the argument on stage that we as parents, we as adults, are increasingly commodifying 
our youth in sport. Now, parenting in sport can be difficult, right? We have so many hats. We have so many roles. We're the coaches, the referees, the launderers, chauffeurs, psychologists, and increasingly, unofficial agents to our children in sport. And by engaging in these roles, parents have an opportunity to build a sense of meaning and connection in their children's lives. And that's a great thing. But it stands to reason that as children get down the road a few years, their parent, they can become something that their parents are now heavily invested in. And as a result of that investment, oftentimes parents expect some form of return to them. Whether in the form of a starting role, a varsity letter, a college scholarship, or a professional contract, at what point do these outcomes tip the scale such that the parent feels a satisfactory return on the family's investment? You see, today, we're engaging in a youth sport context where these outcomes aren't achievable for every child. Last year, roughly 30 million youth participated in organized sport. And of those, roughly 1 in 25 will go on to participate at the varsity level in high school. And just 1 in 500 will go on to play in college, even fewer on scholarship. And don't even get me started about the parent who tells me my kid is going to play professionally, an opportunity just one in 200,000 youth will ever have. Today, I ask you, is your kid that kid? Even if you answered yes, it's important to understand that at some point, somebody will tell us all we're not good enough anymore. It happened to my friend Armando at age 10, most of my high school teammates at 18, and it happened to me at 27. So what then? When sport is over, is a parent's investment lost? It's an important question because, you see, sport ends for all of us. And our society has done a wonderful job of communicating the message that outcomes, more specifically status-related outcomes, matter. So like it or not, the pressure's on, big pressure, for our children to achieve big outcomes today in sport. I study this stuff, and sometimes I don't even see how big these messages are because they're so ubiquitous. This past Christmas, for instance, my one-year-old son, Bridger, received a bin to help organize some of the toys in our loft at home. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty type A. My wife might actually say OCD, but I'm all for an organized loft. But when I was playing with Bridger one day, the messages on the bin struck me. Rookie of the year. All-star. Scoring champion. MVP. Hall of Fame. That's an awful lot to aspire to for a little man who just turned one, learning to walk, and is still in diapers. Now, I'm not going to share the name of the person who got Bridger the gift, because, frankly, on stage today, I don't want to throw my mom under the bus. <laughs> but the messages are everywhere, at our local Walmart, on television, in the books on our kids' shelves. Participation is nice but it's being the best that matters. And that's how we, society, we, communities, and we, parents, often determine ROI, a return on our investments. Now, many of my friends and colleagues, and definitely my former teammates, would argue that it should be youth sports' primary mission to find and nurture the best of the best, whether for college, for the Olympics, or for the professional ranks. And part of me gets that argument. Again, I've participated at that highest level of organized sport. But what about the children that we leave behind if we subscribe to this vision of trickle-down professionalization? In light of our nation's obesity epidemic, should we not be fostering sport opportunities for everyone across the lifespan? If yes, I think it becomes important to understand why children quit. In short, it's because they're not motivated. I don't like sport as much, they tell me. I like other things better, they acknowledge. My parents expect too much of me, they lament. When kids are young, they love going to practice. They wake up so excited for their games. So what happens to that motivation? Do they become lazy? Do they not develop good work ethic? 
about an alternative explanation that we, the parents, are hijacking the three things that give lifeblood to that very motivation? A sense of ownership, a sense of success, and a sense of connection. Now we know from research conducted by social psychologists at the University of Chicago that individuals engaged in the planning of an activity are more often motivated by external rewards. Think salary bonuses in the workplace and trophies in sport. Conversely, individuals engaged in the execution of an activity are most often motivated by internal rewards, things like learning and enjoyment. So how do you think that parents, as they watch their kids in sport, are motivated? Right, by outcomes like playing time, scoring, and winning. And the children? By processes like building relationships, learning new skills, and having fun. Having fun. It's no secret that one of the primary drivers of children's motivation in organized youth sport is how much fun they're having. Quite simply, when kids are enjoying themselves, they want to play. Well, my research team and I, a couple years ago, became interested in how parents' investment in the organized youth sports of their children impacted those children's outcomes. Perhaps naively, we expected that children who had parents that invested more money in their children's organized sports would have better experiences. I mean, they play on the best teams, they have the best coaches, they're able to travel far and wide to tournaments and camps, and they wear the best equipment. What could possibly go wrong? What we found may surprise us, but it probably shouldn't have. You see, children from families whose parents spent more on their organized youth sports actually felt more pressure, real or perceived, to succeed. And that pressure was associated with less enjoyment and lower motivation to continue participating. Let me repeat that. Children from families who spent more on their youth sports felt more pressure, had less fun, and were less likely to continue playing. So it seems that parents, in an effort to give their kids the best experience and the best opportunity for success in sport, are doing the exact opposite. Now, simple arithmetic tells us that motivation, plus something that we already inherently value, like money, should actually enhance our motivation. Unfortunately, motivation isn't subject to the laws of simple arithmetic. In his best-selling book, Predictably Irrational, behavioral economist Dan Airely points out that when we attach money to or invest in something that's already inherently rewarding, we actually undermine that motivation. Now, I can speak to this in a profound and personal way. When I was eight, nine, maybe 10 years old, I would play football on the playground at recess. And I was good. And I remember a number of conversations with my classmates where I would share a pie in the sky dream of someday playing in the NFL. Can you believe those guys get paid? I would say. I would play in the NFL for free. Fast forward to my mid 20s, add a decent six figure salary to the mix. And I remember sitting at home, depressed, thinking, man, they don't pay me enough for this shit. The power of money is real, and it's not always a good thing. Now, beyond the athlete and the family, the commodification in youth, the, com the commodification in youth sport today has potential consequences at a societal level as well. You see, it changes sport from a meritocracy where everyone can play to an arena of elitism. My wife, Bree, ran track and cross country in college, and she shared on a number of occasions that she loved those sports because as she says, the clock don't lie. You line up, you start, and when you get to the finish line, whoever gets there the fastest wins. I don't know if I can think of a better metaphor for life. Unfortunately, the real world doesn't actually work that way. Standing here on stage today, I acknowledge many of the advantages I had growing up in youth sport. Well, many of those I competed with and against started at that proverbial starting line, I had a head start. I had parents who cared. Parents could afford the equipment, the travel, the coaching. But most importantly, 
I had parents who didn't expect anything in return. Today, in my professional role, I'm so very lucky that I get to work with a generation of parents and try and help reshape them from a set of parents who's maybe more passionate about youth sport than their children. I get to work with those very same children and share with them my love for youth sport that started at the neighborhood and community level, not on strategically concocted elite travel teams. Perhaps most importantly, I get to share with families the idea that it's okay not to mortgage their lives in an effort to keep up with the Joneses. You see, I'm living proof that families don't have to do that to enjoy and benefit greatly from sport. So as we wrap up today, I'd like to share with you my vision for youth sport in America. It's a world where children are viewed not as commodities, but as the future leaders of our households, our communities, our country. It's a world where when we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on their organized youth sports, all we expect in return is for them to engage, to love, and to learn. You see, we as parents need to understand that our children will pay us back, not in the form of starting roles, varsity letters, college scholarships, or professional contracts, but in a sense of meaning and connection in their own lives in a lifelong love of sport and physical activity that may help dent our nation's obesity epidemic. Now, I'm still young-ish, and perhaps that lends itself to being a little bit idealistic. But as I leave you today, I encourage you to examine the values that we associate with a more perfect version of youth sport and to compare those values to the actual practices in which we engage. And although I've made a strong case today against applying the economic principles of the free market to organized sport, I acknowledge that one might actually work. A focus on the end user, our children. Thank you.